Okay, so um, welcome back everyone. Hope you had a nice quick break, coffee or something else. Uh, so next up, we've got uh, a session that uh, where Ollie will take us through some of the um, uh, parameters, the QM parameters uh, in CPGK input files. Um, so actually looking into uh, the CPGK input files that are generated by the interface uh, and uh, going through some of the steps that would be useful to know about if you're actually going to use this. So with that, I'll hand over to you, Aline. Hello, everyone. Um, so yeah, this section is going to focus on CPDK parameters. So we've already had a go at using the interface and seeing how, um, when you run the interface, a CPDK input file is generated automatically. And we've taken this and then just, this has gone in and run CPDK in the background um, doing lots and lots of uh, steps, just run each FD step. Um, so what we're going to look at now is how would we want to go about changing anything within this file and why we might want to change it. So we've already had a lecture this morning discussing different basis sets and potentials and ex exchange correlation functionals um, within CP2K and the different types that are available. Um, so now we're kind of going to go put these two things together and look at actually using these within CPDK and how you might go about changing these and investigating which ones you might want to use and verifying that what you've done is a sensible change. Um, so what we're going to look at is... Um, um, so yeah, what we're going to look at in particular is changing the basis set. Um, so changing from using the standard basis mollops that we've seen used in um, in the runs we've been doing so far. Um, looking at using the B3LIP functional. So in the CPTQ inputs we've been using so far, they automate, automatically generate with PBE. Um, PBE is a great functional, but maybe if you want to look at using a hybrid functional uh, with more potentially more accuracy and a greater higher level of theory. How would we do this within CP2K? And look at adding in a distortion correction. So using the Grimmer uh, DFTT D3 correction. And another important point to cover is how we check the convergence of the grid. So this involves tuning the cutoff parameter within the CP2K input file and look at how we will check for convergence into the energy and showing that you've chosen a good value. Um, so I'm going to start off by covering just a bit about the CP2K best practice guide. Um, so this is something we've put together um, to um, cover QMMM simulations within CP2K. So this is kind of was put together for CP2K using standalone CP2K with QMMM on its own. However, lots of it is relevant to using um, it with in combination with Gromax. So here are some um, kind of the information that you can find within the CP2K best practice guide. And I've put links here, to stuff that's particularly relevant um, when you're using it with Gromax. So for example, um, if you want to look at understanding the QM part, um, there's a section that covers the QMM input, um, so the important section within CPTK. It gives uh, descriptions about all the different parameters you might have and why you might choose these and some information there. Um, it gives an overview of basis sets and the types available and the, the different um, the different descriptions of all the different types, so covering the single zeta, double zeta, and the polarization ones that we've discussed earlier. Um, overview of exchange functionals available, uh, the different types, how you use these within the CPGK input, um, so the different sections that you would actually add into the file, how you might do these, uh, overview of more, more advanced ones, so hybrid methods. Uh, PB0 and B3LEP um, also covers some information about pseudo potentials, dispersion corrections, and then an overview of important QM parameters. So, what 
what these can be set to, um, why you choose these values, and how important they are, might be. And there's a bit about troubleshooting at, at the end. Um, so yeah, that covers most of the stuff there. Um, it's also an overview of how to run CPDK, so setting up what the output actually means. So you might have looked at that, this uh, yesterday, it prints quite a lot of output, what is actually going on here, it's useful to understand. Um, so yeah, it's just something to be aware of. And yeah, during this exercise, we will refer to it and point to the relevant sections. So part one of this exercise is going to look at changing the basis set. So we're starting off with an input file. Uh, this will be a CPTK input file on its own. And you'll have this input file and the PDB file, which will contain the co coordinate information. So this is kind of, if you've gone away and run the interface, this is a typical input file that they might generate. And we're going to look at tailoring options within this input file and changing these. So the first step is we're going to look at changing the basis set from this basis molopt basis to the HFX basis. So we're doing this here in preparation for the next part of the exercise where we're going to be looking at using B3lib. Um, when you're changing to a different uh, functional and look at particularly hybrid functionals, you might want to look at changing the basis set in combination with this. So particularly using basis molopt um, with hybrid methods. Um, it's quite a large basis set. And if you try and do this, your calculation will be really slow, especially if you've got um, a large number of QM atoms. So yeah, this is, this is why you might want to change it to the HFX basis. Um, so you can find the download the input files um, from these locations here. And yeah, get set up on Archer 2, log into Archer 2 again, and then we'll start running some of these calculations. So key points to change, um, you'll have to change the basis set file name. So this is the file name for, for the basis sets, and I'll show you where these files are come from and what's in them in a second. And then look at changing the basis set option um, within these as well. So this is given for each element. So your key line here is the basis set file name, which is here is basis molot. I want to change this to HFX basis. And uh, further on down in the input file, you'll find a all these sections for each of the different elements. And here your key line is basis set um, so here, which we want to change to um, TZVP, so this, uh, TZV2PGTH, so this is a triple valence potential with uh, two polarization functions. So here are the instructions. Um, I will just switch to sharing my terminal now because I think that's going to be more helpful. Okay, can everyone see my terminal window? Yep. Yep. Great. Um, so here I have uh, all the files we're going to need for the start of this exercise. So if you um, need any of these, you can get them from the commands shown in the exercise. So yeah, just first go and grab those. Um, and then the job script I've also placed um, in the practical instructions. So you can just copy and paste this into a text file. So yeah, this, let's just take a look at our input file. So at the moment, this is the typical one generated by when you run the interface. So you can see you have the basis molopt, uh, your potential name there, um, PBE used as the exchange function, exchange correlation functional, um, you've got your cell, um, your QM atoms listed already, which have been generated nicely, and your link atoms and all the information there. So yeah, the key line you want to change is the base set file name, which is found towards the top. And then these 
within these kind sections, you want to change the basis set itself. So yeah, I was going to explain what are these basis basis set files. So they are actual files. Um, if you've built CPTK correctly, they're included from the data directory. So if you know where CPTK is installed on your computer, um, so in this case, it's installed in this directory here, um, work shared, work Y07 shared CPTK, CPTK 8.1. Um, there's also a data directory within this. And if you LS this directory, you can see all the base available basis set file names. So you have here your basis molot, um, your HFX basis, and yeah, not only basis sets, but also the potentials are stored here. Um, some different parameter files. So there's also the parameters needed for DFTD3 for the dispersion correction. So these are all stored here. Um, and if you ever want to see what available basis sets there are for a particular element within a certain file, you can uh, do a, like a, a grep search for that element. So for example, for hydrogen, if you want to check for hydrogen within these files um, or a particular file. Add CPK 8.1 data and then your basis molopt. Uh, this gives you all the different basis sets found for your hydrogen. Um, and you can see here the DZVP basis molopt that we're currently using. Um, and it's the same for, usually the same for most of your common elements, there'll be the same available ones so for carbon, for example. And then, yeah, for our a change that we're making in the HFX basis. Oh, didn't work as well. Um, okay, maybe I've just searched for the wrong thing. But yeah, you can have a look at all these files and they're pretty useful to see what basis sets are available. Okay. Yep. Can you see the questions? Oh, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong place. No, that's fine. It's just a, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, that's a... uh, yeah, so for copper, to use DCVP for copper, do I need to use these, uh, I'm not to say the short range one basis set. Um, so for copper, let's just have a look at the available ones quickly. Um, copper. Wait a minute. I've forgotten my elements. Copper is the CU, yeah. Uh, yeah, so your option there. So a lot of the metals only have the short range um, malt basis sets available. So yeah, this is probably your best option. So yeah, SR stands for short range. Um, cool. So yeah, I suggest if, you're, if there are any other questions, um, people go on to looking at that exercise. So just it shouldn't take you too long. Just make those changes within your input file and then go ahead and run it. So I'm going to do this here.
um, you should be modifying the basis set file name, just changing the basis set at the moment. Okay, so that should be running. So yeah, just raise your hand once you've submitted the calculation because we'll go through looking at the output together. And does CPTK like Orca spit out warning messages when things have gone wrong? And conversely, if a job completed successfully message. Um, so yeah, it does spit out warning messages. Um, you have to be quite careful. Sometimes it spits out warning messages and they're buried within a lot of text and you need to find them. So sometimes it will do a, do a full crash and it'll be very obvious that things have gone wrong. Um, other times, yeah, there are warning messages buried within quite a lot of text. So you can usually do a search for the keyword warning. Um, um, when it's completed, so we'll look at this in a second, but it prints a timer report at the bottom. Um, so you can always tell if it's run to full completion. But yeah, you do have to be quite careful sometimes if particular things like SEF not converging um, can kind of get buried, particularly if you're running like quite a long MD calculation. Okay, cool. Yeah. So some people have done this um, and yeah, there's a very small difference in the energy. So basically this step is a preparation step towards the next exercise. So if you've run this calculation, oh, mine's not done what I wanted. Um, oh, I've made a typo. That's great. Um, what did I miss? Oh, I didn't change the basis to, to Molot from Molot, right? Did I change the wrong line? I did. Great. <laughs> um, so this was this potential. Okay, let's try that again. Yeah, thanks for noticing. <laughs> it's quite easy to make mistakes like that. <laughs> Which explains why people could, were confused about basis set final and potential partner. <laughs> yeah, in fact, I think it was only you who just pointed it out who was wondering about that. Yeah. Uh, okay. Hopefully. Okay. Brilliant. This looks like it's worked. Uh, so yes, we've got our CPTK output file that's been produced, and we've also got these Gromax restart.wfn files, which have also been produced. So these are wave function files. So these basically can be used to provide uh, like a starting guess for an SCF run if you're then to run this calculation again. Um, so these files are actually like quite important for what we're going to be doing for the next step. When we move to, use, uh, move to using B3lib, uh, we're going to take these files and use them to provide initial guess. And this will be really helpful because they can um, change the exchange correlation function. And these will help really speed up the calculation. So reading these files is always a good thing to do. Um, yeah, regardless of what you're doing, it really helps with the first SCF step. Um, so yeah, have a quick look at our CPTK output file. Um, so here is the output. Um, so it prints out a lot of stuff at the start, mainly reading in all your parameters that you've set in the input file. You can see here we're doing a QRM calculation, which is good. Um, and yeah, so it starts printing stuff about the SCF, so the convergence of the self-consistent functional. Um, you can see here the energies printed out and this convergent factor slowly getting smaller. Um, so it 
left the inner loop after reaching 20 steps. Um, this 20 steps is a parameter set in the file, so you can modify this for it to do more steps before it um, goes around and then does a, another outer SCF loop. Um, so all of this is explained in the best practice guide. If I'm going a bit quick here, but eventually you'll see this number get smaller and then it will print SCF run converged in 15 steps. So you know it's been successful. Um, and then it'll <clears throat> print out the final energy here. So this is your total energy, the QMM energy. Uh, this is a printed in atomic units, so heart trees, um, which isn't always the most useful unit. Um, but this is the default unit used within CPTK. So if you want to convert this into a more useful unit, um, just go and look up the multiplication factor. So I've written somewhere in the notes the multiplication factor to convert this into kilojoules per mole. Um, then a lot of statistics. And at the very end here, references. Um, it prints a timing report. So this will always be printed at the very end. And you can see um, the runtime for the whole calculation here. Um, so this CPTK is the whole thing, it's just the subroutine, it's the whole code. Um, and then this will be your runtime for the whole, the whole calculation. And then it also prints time reports for all the different subroutines called, which is sometimes pretty useful. Okay, so yeah, this is what you'd record if you're looking at the runtime and then further up the energy, um, which I showed. So yeah, within your notes, you can see I've put some commands for extracting the energy and the runtime from the output. So yeah, the next step is to just make a note of these. Um, and then also we want to keep this wave function file for the next part of the exercise. So to ensure that it's not overwritten, we're just gonna rename it because what would happen if you ran this calculation again, it would overwrite the restart file, wave function file with the same thing again. So we just wanna kind of checkpoint this. So um, we're just gonna rename it um, EGFP restart wfx and then that is saved um yeah so that's the end of the first part um so yes um raise hands if you're ready to move on to the second part um i'll answer some questions Although the QM atoms are defined in the CPTK input file, the PDB file has the residue, res name column filled with MM and QM flux. Is there a way to instruct to refile that info from the PDB file or it needs to be redefined in the input file? Um, so it has to be defined in the input file. That is the part where CPTK knows that they are QM atoms. Um, the thing is here that every, everything we're using has been generated by the interface. So the PDB file and the input file are kind of generated at the same time based on what the QM atoms are. So it's, yeah, it's kind of all done at, at the same time. So it's, when you're producing this PDB file with the QM atoms, you're also producing the input file in the interface. So. Yeah, it was, it's not really a point. Um, but yeah, the CPTK needs, very much needs um, the QM atoms in this format in the input file that you've seen. Um, but yeah, hopefully the internet, the interface does this all for you. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, good point, Arno. Um, yeah, Gromax restart when function has nothing to do with Gromax. So yeah, this is just a name. Um, this is defined in your input file. It's the project name. So it's 
yeah, it's just a name. You could put anything there and it would work just as well. But this is what is output when we run the interface into this file. OK, so I'm going to move on to the second part. Um, let's just clear that. Um, so yeah, second part of this exercise, we'll look at adding in a B3 lip and dispersion corrections. So we've already looked at this, uh, the input we have. This uses PBE. Um, however, we can quite easily change this within the CPTK input file. So we're going to look at changing it to B3 lip. Um, so this is a high a hybrid functional and um, half of this will be half of it, well not half, but a portion of it will come from the Hartree Fock exchange. Um, thus, thus it's more accurate. Um, but you'll find it's more computa computationally expensive than GGA methods such as PBE. So your um, area of interest in the input file, if you scroll down, uh, you'll see this XC section. Um, so this is what it looks like at the moment. We just have um, some parameters specified here, the density, gradient, cutoff, and tau cutoff. And we have the XC functional section here, which just lists uh, one thing that we're using PBE. Um, so what we're going to do is, be, is we'll change this to use DFTD3. Um, so yeah quite a lot of changes that go into this. It looks like quite a lot of text, but I'll just quickly explain it. Um, so you can see here, um, you have the different um, contributions which make up B3LIP. So yeah, these numbers here tell you the amount of this contribution and list it. So using 81% of the LIP correlation, 72% of the BEC88 exchange and 19% of LDA correlation. Um, so if you look back on the lecture, this is actually in the formula for B3 lip. So all we're doing is just directly specifying how much of these different parameters we use. Um, so this part comes in the under the XC functional. So this is kind of your, your GGA portion um, of the hybrid method. And then we have this HF method, so the Hartree Fox section. Um, and here we specify 20% of the Hartree Fox exchange to be used. Holly? Yeah. Uh, just wondering, at the moment I'm seeing your terminal, is that right? Oh, I forgot to switch. Okay, yeah, just, yeah. just checking. Yeah, I think as, as soon as you start yeah. explaining the, uh, the, the different percentage contributions, yeah. I couldn't see it reflected in the, in the terminal. So. Okay, yeah, I will switch to sharing the different. Um, sorry, everyone. Okay, so yes, um, these are the different parameters I've just been describing. Um, so this is the section that you'll be modifying in your file. Um, so yeah, we have the Hartree Fox section here. Um, we're using 20% of the Hartree Fox exchange. Um, so yeah, all these parameters just basically make up the description of B3LIP. Um, so we have this screening section. So this is to help stabilize the um, Hartree Fock exchange. Um, some parameters here. So EPF Schwartz, um, this is a parameter you can kind of play with. If you find that your calculations are a bit unstable, then what you might see is like weird energy jumps when you're running the SCF. So this is something you can look at. Um, and then you have this trunc truncated operator here, which um, basically prevents self-exchange interactions across the uh, neighboring grid, neighboring grids. So um, yeah, it's got a cutoff, which should be less than half the cell to prevent this interaction across neighboring grids. Uh, memory, you don't really need to worry about. Um, this is just set set the maximum memory that you want to consume um, will depend on your com on the machine you're running on and how much memory there is per process. And then uh, this Walder van der Waals potential section. So this is for your DFTD3, uh, your Grimmer dispersion interactions. Um, basically, you're telling it you're doing a pair potential 
Um, you want to use the parameters for DFT3, which are in this particular file. Um, this is, again, in the same directory as the basis sets and potentials and the type, and then your reference functional, which is speciallib and the cutoff. Um, so yeah, I think that covers that part. Um, so some other subtle changes you will also need to make. Um, so in the last section, we made these, uh, these wave function restart files. Uh, we just need to add a line here after where you specify the potential to tell it to read these particular, this particular restart file name so it knows the name of it. And we're also going to change the potential here um, to one that's optimized for BLIP rather than PBE. Um, so yeah, we noticed before um, this potential was GTH PBE. I'm um, just changing this to GTH BLIP because it makes more sense to use this in combination with B3LIP than using PBE. Um, so yeah, it's just a small change. But yeah, TPDK has a lot of these potentials and they're optimized for using with particular functionals. So it's just something to be aware of. Um, so yeah, I'll let people do that. Um, and yeah, let me know if you have any questions. So just yeah, make these changes and run again. Um, yeah, make, make sure you've recorded the energy from the last one or you've moved that file to a different place because it will overwrite your cptk.out file. Uh, yes, we can also use dispersion correction with PBE. So yeah, you don't have to go all the way and add in um, hybrid functional and PBE. Um, any reason why the cutoff of 16 antrums? Um, so it's kind of, yeah, cutoff for to be within the realm of how you want your, how, how far you want your dispersion correction interactions to be. Um, your van der Waals interactions. So it's kind of a typical number. It's probably something you could play around with, but yeah, 10 to sort of 20 angstroms seems to be the norm. Oh yeah, so yeah, why, why one might want to use a restart wave function? So yeah, it's usually when you run a first, your first SCF step with, without a restart wave function, you'll see um, it does a way more like SEF steps to try and converge. Um, and this will like obviously take more time. If you're supplying the restart wave function, it's already got like a nice initial guess um, to start with. And it will just basically speed up the calculation and reduce the number of SEF steps. Um, and you'll, you'll see this if you when you're running the second part compared to the first part, you should see that the first, there will be a lot less SCF steps in the first step. It will still take longer because we're using a more expensive hybrid functional. So yeah, don't get confused about that. But. Um, so we felt long can we from calculations with different functional basis set? Uh, yes. Um, well, here we've got the same basis set. Um, I think usually using the same basis set is key um, but it can be with a different functional um, so obviously it won't be a perfect guess but it'll it'll help the count help with speeding up the calculation so obviously your system is still the same like your atoms and your coordinates so yeah has any have people done and looked at the energies um, so you see there's a slight change in the energy. OK, so yeah, this is my energy here is using it's B3 lip. And then the one below was the first one we did with uh, PB0. Um, so you can see it's roughly 0 0.04 difference in the energy here. This is in heart trees. So what's that? in? kilojoules per mole. Okay, yeah, so quite a big difference in kilojoules per mole. Um, so yeah, this is just 
a static energy calculation. So you can see there's been a difference. Um, however, if you were like doing this for real, you'd probably want to go away and calculate your actual property of interest. Um, so if you're running like an MD simulation, you might want to go away and compare the two. Or if you're calculating, say, an energy barrier or something like that. Um, oh, yeah, the time. So how long did this one take? 25 seconds. How long did my other one take, which is upper directory? Oh, about the same. OK, that's interesting. Um, so yeah, this time, yeah, so I noticed this too. Um, I'm guessing it's because we've supplied the SCF wave function for this one. So in the first one, um, the first part of the calculation, we'd have done, we did, what, so we did 20 SCF steps and then another 15. So we did 35 total. Um, so we did more at the start. And this one, um, it converged quite quickly, I believe. Yeah, so only 13 um, steps. So you can see each one of those steps is taken 0.4. And in the other one, hopefully be quicker 0.3 so yeah uh, each fcf fcf step was shorter in the first one um so this is the time per step um shorter and with pb0 but we ended up running more fcf steps because we didn't start with the pre-converged wave function <laughs> mine's been stuck running for 12 minutes oh no um i mean check what's going on inside the output file if it looks like it's converging or not converging, it might be that it didn't somehow didn't read the um, initial wave function file, um, and that it's, it's kind of stuck trying to converge the SCF, um, or it might just be something's gone wrong on the compute node. I don't know. It's a bit worrying. Yeah, double check. Um, let's double check you've got that that file there, the the wave function reset file in the right place, and double check the you've supplied that night uh, that line which says the name of that file and that the spelling is correct. Um, okay. Yeah. So. I'll move on to the third exercise now. Um, the third part of the exercise, we're going to look at converging the cutoff. So usually you have this, well, you have this integration grid using for mapping the electronic density um, in CPDK, and you want to check that this grid used is fine enough. Um, so you have this cutoff keyword in the input file, um, that just defines the cutoff in Ryberg, which kind of relates the finest level of the multi-grid. So basically, the higher your plane wave cutoff, the finer the grid. Um, so yeah, this is kind of an important step when running a CP2K calculation. You always want to check that your cutoff is large enough. Um, otherwise, your energies could be wrong. Um, so in the interface, the default cutoff written to the CP2K input file is 450 Ibergs. Um, so you'll see that uh, if you currently open the file that you have at the moment. Um, yeah, so this is quite a large, fairly large value for the cutoff. So it should automatically, so it's set to kind of, you know, be, be sure that the cutoff will be large enough, regardless of what you're doing, because you don't want incorrect results. Um, so yeah, it's a reasonable value. Um, so here's, for example, is the cutoff total energy versus cutoff for your the initial input. So the PBE example. 
Um, you can see here, um, it's quite a drastic change in energy if you use anything below 150. Um, and then you can see it stabilizes quite nicely um, above that value. And there will be still some like subtle differences in this value that you can't see in this graph. But yeah, so 450, uh, quite a large value. Um, yeah, so cutoff is kind of a funny value. Um, if you, yeah, you need to use a large enough value. If you go way too large, it can quite slow down the simulation quite a lot. So you, you have to sort of balance this. Um, but yeah, you might want to look into tuning this. You definitely don't want to use a value too small. Maybe sometimes using a really large value could slow down your calculation quite a lot. Um, so this exercise we're going to look at just converging the cutoff um, for our new system. So we've made changes to the input file. We've changed the basis sets, the fun functional, the potential. We've added in dispersion corrections. Um, whenever you make major, major changes, if you were yeah, running C2K on its own, you'd want to go and double check that your cutoff is still reasonable and reconverge it. Um, so this is basically what we're going to do here. Um, kind of running multiple calculations and changing the cutoff each time and recording the total energy. Yes, so to perform these calculations with the fit hybrid. So taking your input that you've modif just modified and added in um, your B3 lip and dispersion correction. Um, yeah, your, your value is this cutoff here. It should be quite near the top. So just change this example. Um, write it and then run it and record the energy. Um, you're meant to want to make sure again that you're using the restart wave function file, otherwise you could run into trouble with it taking a long time. Okay, I have a question. How do we decide the scale C, scale X and values in the XC part? So these values come from the definition of V3 lip itself. Um, so I don't know if I can reshare the best practice guide quickly. QM treatment. Uh, functional hybrid methods. Okay, so for example, here with PB0, in the definition of PB0, it's comprised of 75% of PB and 25% of Pantry Fock Exchange. Um, so this kind of defines how these values are set. So you've got 25% here um, for the Hartree Fock exchange, um, and then 75% of the GG exchange, and then 100% of the GG correlation. Um, you can see the equation for it here. Uh, B3LIP is more complicated than PB0. Um, so it's basically comprised of um, an LDA part, which is of the exchange function, um, some different part, the Hartree-Fock exchange, another part of the GG exchange, and some correlation from LDA. And that's going off the screen. I can't, can I? okay, make it bigger. Um, yeah, some other parts. Um, so this is covered in Emiliano's lecture. Um, so basically, these are the different parameters, and this is how they are defined in the CPDK input. So you can see um, we've got this contribution of the lip coloration here, which is 0.81. And um, this is set here um, in your input file. Um, so yeah, it's somewhat a little bit confusing to work out where they all come from. Some of them are more straightforward. So you can see uh, it's 20% of the Hartree Fock exchange, so 0.2 there. Um, yeah, some of them have been come around where you have to subtract values from others. So you can see yeah, your coloration is 19% LDA and 81% lip. So that sums to a whole. And then if you sum these the exchange parts up as well, that sums to 100% as well. So yeah, that's where they come from. Okay, so we have some values already. So we have... Okay, 
150, 150, 150, 150, 150, 500. Um, yeah, so we're missing 100, 200, 300, 350. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, if you've done one and you filled it in, uh, feel free to pick a value in the scratch pad that hasn't been done yet and you can add in another line if you want. Okay, yeah, so big difference for 50. Okay, um, I see that we've got values for most of the cutoffs now, which is good. I'll let people continue to add those while I just answer some of the questions. Um, so I'm wondering how much the influence will be on the court that I apply a setup when I need to team in. Um, yeah, I mean, it's difficult to say. Um, so for certainly if you use a very low value of a cutoff, your results could be wrong. Um, we actually did a, a kind of a look at this as well, um, modifying the cutoff. And you see if, obviously you can see there's subtle differences in the energy here between different values. And then if you go ahead and run like a long MD simulation, kind of the, the effect of that and affecting the energies and the forces which are calculated will sort of be mag <clears throat> magnified over the course of the run. So yeah, it can kind of have more of an effect if you're running a long MD simulation. Um, will we see some variation in energy for two calculations of the same cutoff. Yeah, there, there's a bit of variation. Um, you can run um, the same CPGK calculation with exact same parameters twice and the energies will not be exactly the same. Um, so you see the, I mean, you'd expect them to be the similar have values here, for example, where two people have done the same thing. And yeah, that's kind of what I expect. So if you look at 250 here, um, beyond say one, two, three, six decimal places um, you, is where you typically start to see variations just, but yeah, this is very small at this point in terms of your actual energy. Um, I was going to quickly share, so I've just made a graph. I basically took everyone's results and I've just made a little graph here. Um, so you can see this is kind of what the energy is doing with the cutoff. So before we kind of said oh, 150 plus, it looked like it sort of converged, but it's difficult to tell. Um, here, even 200 might not be enough. So I'd say like you could possibly say 300 plus um 350 should be a suitable value but yeah you can still see some variation going from like 200 to 250. um so yeah that was a quick summarize of that um i will now just cover a bit more of the performance so this is the very last part this is an exercise this will just be um me talking for a bit the very last part is just looking at the performance. So we've kind of seen how performance can be affected when you change um, to using different functionals. So th these are some, some results I got earlier and I did see a difference um, from switching from PBE to V3LIP. Um, and you could see the runtime had, had gone up. Um, I don't know what I've done differently this time. But, um, so yeah, um, you expect change into using like a more complex functional such as V3LIP to increase the runtime overall. And we only did like one step here. So when you're running an MD calculation, you're running multiples of these steps. You're calling it once every MD step. So you'd effect, expect the effect to be larger overall. Um, and our first step's a bit weird because we're dealing with sort of account, doing the first like setup and the SCF calculating the wave function. So yeah, we had strange results because we were reading in the wave function, the second uh, example with VTLIP and not in the first one. So, but yeah, you can see that the time PS SCF step was longer for VTLIP. Um, so yeah, here's some similar results uh, looking at different functionals. So 
one is PBE and PBE zero. So this is a, the time per MD step. This is a lot bigger system. So you'll notice time per step is huge here um, compared to what we've been looking at before where we only had around 20 QM atoms. This has 68. Um, but you can see it's almost a sign of a, a double in the time taken per step, just running on uh, one node of Cirrus here. Um, but yeah, you can see um, it takes much longer, but also the uh, the scaling, the speed up here is a bit improved. So you can kind of justify running on multiple nodes. Um, yeah, there's also some stuff about QM region size here. Um, so I've looked at uh, changing the QM region size. So you have 19 and 253 QM atoms. Um, but for the same system, and you can see the effect of runtime there, on runtime there. And then um, some information about using multiple threads. So at the moment, we've just been running on a single thread for these calculations. Um, but sometimes it's advantageous to use multiple threads per process, so MPI plus OpenMP. Um, so there's some different results here, um, just showing the effect. So, example in this system using six threads is a lot faster than using one thread. So these are just um, things to be aware of um, when you're running your own system. If you want to look at the performance, um, give you a rough idea of what to expect and yeah, kind of what changes you might make to help improve the performance, um, how many core, cores or nodes you want to run on. Um, so this will all be added to the best practice guide shortly. But, um, important thing is just experiment with your own systems. Cool. Um, I'll have a quick look at the questions, but that's all I want to say. Um, could you explain conceptually how these calculations are parallelized? Um, it's yes, <laughs> it's very complicated. Um, I think mainly it's parallelized towards the grid uh, function. So when you do multi grid, yeah, yeah, it, it parallelized towards that. So you have a grid points and you have a grid a grid which consists of a large number of points and they can be split that points uh, uh, could be split along the nodes and uh, each node take uh, some small part of the grid and calculate everything in that grid uh, in that part of the grid and then they uh, uh, sum up all contributions from all nodes. In a way, this is a pretty similar algorithm as like uh, PME works in Gromox with classical MD. It also decomposes the system into smaller parts and uh, and calculates them separately. Yes, uh, FFT is also utilized uh, for the grids to, to pass it to the reciprocal space and back uh, density from it. And uh, uh, but of course, this is very well known and par par parallel algorithms which are already implemented in, let's say, FFTV library and so on. Yeah, it's also employed. Actually, very funny thing, uh, might not, uh, not many known, but in previous P2K, at least it's 7.1, I don't know how it's working in 3.1, it isn't tested, but uh, P2K very well liked when the number of MPI uh, tasks which you are running should be uh, some uh, square of some number, for example, 84, yeah, it's square of eight. Why? Because because of that grid decomposition, which it uses. <laughs> so uh, the, the best performance usually, which I observed, was uh, exactly when your number of MPI tasks, not open and thread, but MPI tasks, is square of some number. Uh, yes. Uh, don't choose, yeah, pri not prime numbers, but uh, for course, it's better to choose uh, a square of some number. Yes. Okay, yes, I guess it provides, but yeah, it's very funny. It, it's actually connected to the parallelization scheme over the grid switch CP2 game plays. It uh, comes to how it splits the grid over the nodes. So I think we uh, we realize that this is one of the one of the areas where we probably the best practice guide at Holly Link to we plan to expand with some more guidance yes. on this in future. Uh, also, what I saw uh, from the Holly stock that uh, if you noticed uh, the default cutoff which uh, uh, Gromox p 2 k interface set up is 450 Rydbergs, and this is a quite high number in reality. Uh, why it's done so? It's done so because it should be suitable for most uh, of the 
system you can imagine. So probably in real uh, calculations, it always works to reduce it because it it speed ups the, your simulations a lot in reality. So yeah, but 450 is kind of safe uh, cutoff, which is suitable for 99% of the system, biological system. Uh, is there are some unparameterized models that have to be treated in the main part? It's possible to use P2K for the seems quite promising because of the FT, charges, hash, and optimization derivative, and so on. So, yeah, um, for parameterization of the molecules, usually you should use uh, software which not connected to the QM implementation, but to the MM. So, for example, for underport field, usually one should use uh, antechamber. Uh, and uh, in that antechamber, the parameterization procedure is uh, explained, I guess. And in antechamber, for example, you need to generate him uh, several. Uh, so uh, you need to generate uh, cube files with electron density uh, from the several geometries of that molecule, which it generates you. And usually it is, should be done with Gaussian. Uh, what they suggest is Gaussian uh, with some like this relief, I guess, 631G star basis. But yeah, I, I mean, you also can use CP2K in that case. Yeah. So the risk charges is not enough for usually for the force field. Uh, for force field, you need to do a risk charge in several points and then in several geometries because yeah, uh, the force field should cover more geometries. And only after that, it averages somehow. Uh, yeah, that's one of the procedures. Another, if you don't have, I mean, if you want to use a QM for parameterization, it's better to go to the particular force field which you want to use and check how it should be parameterized. Usually, yeah, it's indeed parameterized with QM, like both charm and amber are parameterized with QM calculations. Uh, and basically check uh, the procedure. It's not a good idea to use another method than the standard user to the force field because then you have inconsistency in your force field. Because uh, your protein, for example, will parameterize with one method and your ligand will be parameterized with another QM method, which is not the best idea in general. Yeah, but uh, if you want to do a QMMM, then it's, it's completely okay to use uh, whatever MM charges you think will be suitable because anyway, you will then switch to QM, uh, QM uh, uh, description of your ligand, for example. And QM, of course, is not dependent already on that. Okay. All right. Well, um, thanks very much. Thanks, Dimitri. Uh, and thanks, Holly, uh, for a useful session. So uh, now we have a break, um, lunch, or whatever your local time appropriate uh, meal is or, <laughs> or not. And we'll see everybody back again at uh, 1 o'clock uh, Central European time um, for uh, the next practical. <laughs>